We come in our second session to look at the white linen and the fine gold of this man of one. And remember, this is an illustration of the saints, a word painting of God manifestation, a picture of perfect discipleship, something though that requires action and preparation on our behalf. As we consider each of the elements, this is what we must become in our lives now if we want to be part of that multitudinous Christ in the world to come. So as we consider this, we'd like to zone in on the, the, the man of one as we read there in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 5. He lifts up his eyes and he looks and behold this man of one who is clothed in linen. So we're going to look at the garments a little bit in our class this morning. Now when we look at this idea of being clothed, it's the Strong's number 3847, the word labash, which means to put on clothes, to be fully clothed, to be clothed... Um, as a sign of rank or status of character. So it's not just about clothing, but it's about what that clothing means. So this is a comment really on this spiritual state that we need to be in. And we need to examine that when we will do in just a moment. The other point we want to pick up though, that this is linen, which is the Hebrew word bad, a white linen, but especially that linen ephod, which is very interesting to us when we consider how this is used in scripture. We think of the child Samuel, who ministered to Yahweh, being a child girded with a linen ephod in 1st of Samuel chapter 2 and verse 18. So it was a symbol of the priests, which is quite fitting because the man of one, the saint, are called to be kings and priests. So this is how they are to be adorned. Now when we come into the law of Moses and we look at this, we see how this plays out. The linen ephod was the purpose of covering the flesh. Now we read this in Exodus chapter 28 and verse 42. Thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness from the loins even to the thighs shall they reach. So this is the, the idea of being fully clothed and being covered in our nakedness. So it's, it's hiding that nakedness. And these were holy garments especially for prepared uh, for the service of, of, the, of the Levites. We read in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 32, the priests whom he shall anoint, that's Moses, and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead, shall he shall make at the atonement and shall put on linen clothes even the holy garment. So when Aaron was to consecrate somebody or to, to or Moses was to in, in the office of the priesthood, they were to be putting on linen clothes and these are considered holy garments. So it was a symbol of status, a symbol of the job that they had to do. Not status in a worldly sense of something to be proud and puffed up about, but in preparation for the job that God requires of us. Now, when we consider this and we see how this is used, we find that that's exactly what the priest did in 1st of Samuel 22 and at verse 18, when the king uh, Saul commanded Doeg to slay the priests, he slew on that day four score and five persons that did wear the linen ephod in 1 Samuel 22 verse 18. So this was the clothing of the priests, that linen ephod. And it's interesting though that David identifies himself with the priests when the Ark of the Covenant is brought up to Jerusalem. In 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 27, David was clothed with a, with a robe of fine linen and all the Levites that bear the ark, the singers uh, and the ministers of the songs um, with the singers, David had also upon an ephod of linen. So this was the clothing of the priests, priestly garments. And as we've said, that's very fitting in the fact that we are called to be kings and priests in that future age. Now, there are also, though, clothes of judgment because it was the priest's responsibility to judge. So when we consider Ezekiel chapter 9 and going back into that vision where Ezekiel was taken, as we looked at in our last class, in spirit to Jerusalem, we find there that there were six men that came from the higher gate uh, that lieth towards the north. Every man had a slaughter weapon in his hand and every man among them um, was clothed with linen with a writer's ink 
king horn by his side. So this is Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. And of course, we know the story there, how the, the, the man with the right as inghorn has to go and put a mark on their foreheads of all those who sigh and cry for the abomination. So they are marked or sealed with the seal of God. And so those then that are clothed in these linen ephods are responsible to go through the city and to judge, to discern, and to put a mark on those who sigh and cry, and then those who had the swords would follow and slay those who didn't. So it's a symbol of, of judgment. It's a symbol of the role of the priest in discerning issues. And of course, people would go to the priests for judgment in the land as well. Now, when we look at the man of one, um, when we see him in Daniel chapter 10, he also comes up in Daniel chapter 7, then said the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters by the river, so Daniel sees him here again, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters by the river. So what we find out is Daniel chapter 7, or Daniel chapter 10, our man of one there is also clothed in in linen. This is the way he is described in his, in his uniform, so to speak. He has those priestly garments upon him. Now, if we take our journey back to the book of Revelation, go back to Revelation chapter 1, if you just want to turn that up, we'll spend a few minutes there as well. We find here that in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man is clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. So again, he is clothed down to the foot. That's a description of the priests. And of course, this has a greater symbolic meaning, and Paul helps us by explaining this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and he talks about here a change so we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked so he was looking for garments of the spirit he wanted a change in nature. He wanted to be clothed with those clothings, basically, which would cover him, which he calls his house or his tabernacle, which is from heaven. And so, of course, that's part of what we look forward to. Now, if we go back to the book of Daniel, we meet another character in Daniel chapter 7, and that is the Ancient of Days. And so what we find here is Daniel basically witnesses this vision of someone called the Ancient of Days. In chapter 7, verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hairs of his head like pure wool, and his throne was like a fiery flame, and wheels as burning fire, and a fiery stream issues and comes forth from before him, and thousands and thousands ministered unto him, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him, and the judgment was set and the books were open. So this is a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how do we know that? Well, he doesn't sit upon the throne until other thrones are cast down. God has always been on his throne. Uh, Christ was to sit upon the right hand of the Father until the deity made his enemies his footstools, we read in, in, in Psalm 2. He is called the Ancient of Days, the oldest man really that ever lived, whereas God is uncreate. He's surrounded by the saints, so this is a multitudinous picture. He's tied with the cherubic vision, and we notice that his wheels are as burning fire that we read about in Ezekiel chapter 10, which also gives us the idea of the cherubim. And the hair of his head is like wool, which is that lamb-like characteristic that we're going to come and look at later on in one of our future classes. So this is the Ancient of Days, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we see him there in a garment as white as snow. And so this is the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we, we follow this idea of the garment through and its relation to the saints, we have it, of course, in Revelation chapter 19 as well, where we read, Let us be glad and rejoice, verse 7, and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb. And remember the Ancient of Days who has uh, the hair like wool, so this is tying in with that symbology. But we have here his wife who has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So this is the picture of righteousness. So when we look at fine linen that this man of one wears, 
It's a picture described in scripture as the righteousness of the saints. And so we have that as well when we look at Psalm 132 and verse 8 and 9. Arise, O Yahweh, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness. Let thy saints shout, shout for joy. So again, this idea of the priests clothed in white being clothed in righteousness. And we have that as well in, in Job chapter 29, as we've been reading in our readings. Verse 14, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My judgment was a robe and a diadem. So this is the righteousness that is imputed to the saints. Now just turn up, I don't have this, this on the screen, but turn up uh, Romans chapter 4, because imputed righteousness, it's not something that is of our own. Notice there that his wife has made herself ready in, in Revelation 19, and it's granted that she should wear this, this white linen, clean and white. So Romans chapter 4, and we have here in verse 20 a description of Abraham. We read that he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he, which is God, had promised, he is able to perform, and therefore it's imputed to him, for, to Abraham, for righteousness. And it's not written for his sake alone to whom it was imputed to him, but also for us, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. And this is a key point in this, is that Abraham did not consider his own body now dead. And the word there to consider means to fixate his eyes upon his own fleshly weaknesses. And neither can we. We have to believe that what God has promised, he is able to perform. He is able to give us a change in nature. He is able to change our mortal bodies, our vile bodies, to be like his glorious body or the body of his son and change our nature. And what we have to do, engage in that process right now to make righteousness what we're all about in our lives and the things that we do. Now, consider this idea of, of watching because that's part of having righteousness. In Revelation 16, verse 15, we read, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, sometimes, brethren, sisters, and young people, um, people talk about prophecy as sort of being a, something that, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting subject, but it's perhaps an optional thing. Um, I would just like to point out that in this verse, he is telling us that we need to watch and keep our garments. And those two things dovetail. They, they go hand in hand. Because watching, as we look at the events that are going on in the world around us, excites us. We see the hand of God. He's moving the nations. He's doing different things. And also then that motivates us to keep our garments. Unless we walk naked and they see his shame. And sometimes you may even notice this in your own life that you're going along a little track and maybe going a little bit off for a while and then something happens in the world around us and we are jolted to realize that the hand of God is at work in the nations and we need to be diligent and vigilant in the things that we do. And so this is what the Lord Jesus Christ exhorts us to do is to watch. And, and it has that effect as we read in, in Proverbs 29 verse 18, reading from Young's literal translation, without a vision the people uh, is made naked. And whoso keepeth the law, uh, this is his happiness, right? So, so without a vision, the people perish is what the King James Version says. But he that keepeth the law, um, he is basically happy is he, or this is his happiness. Now, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ counsels us to do, is to be diligent. And so in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 18, we read, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and to anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. So this is the whole idea. The Lord says, I want you to be a watching people, and that's going to affect your walk. It's going to affect your clothing. It's going to affect your faith, which we'll look at in a moment, and uh, that's the kind of people we need to be. So as the Lord said in the Gospels, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch and we cannot excuse ourselves from taking a look at what God has revealed in prophecy because this is how he uh, identifies himself it's how he proves his existence that Israel is his witnesses that he is God and so it's a constant reminder to us that this is what we need to be about now this idea of garments 
also has to do with a change of nature. If we take a look at Zechariah and chapter 3, and it's worth turning this up, it's on the screen, but just take a look. Zechariah chapter 3 and at verse 7, we read here that Joshua was clothed in filthy garments. Now that's the situation all of us are before we come into contact with the Lord Jesus Christ and with the truth. And stood before the angel, and he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And say, and he said unto him, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And he said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head, and clothed him with garments. And the angel of Yahweh stood by, and the angel of Yahweh protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, If if thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep uh, my courts, and I will give thee places to walk amongst these that stand by. So there's the challenge to us, brothers and sisters, to walk in God's ways, to keep his chargements, charges, and if we do that, he will give us places amongst those that stand by, amongst the faithful clouds of witnesses that we read of in Hebrews chapter 11 and chapter 12 and verse 1 says that we are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. So we become part of the ruling age if we keep uh, the, the way of the Lord. And we got to believe that he is able to do what he's promised, which is give us a change of nature and a change of garments. So as we, we look at this, this is the promise that we have. It's the message of John to the sons of God in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. So again, it requires action. We hope to be like him in the future age. But what we are supposed to be is the sons of God now. We need to behave as though we are the sons of God now, because that is what we are called to be. And it says here that everybody that has this hope in himself purifieth himself even as he, as he is pure. And so that's the concept of, you know, be holy for I am holy. And this is, of course, what the Lord charges us with in Revelation 3 and verse 4. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. So we have to keep our garments unspotted from the world now if we want to have that change of nature and have those white priestly garments being part of the man of one in the future age. So we have to look at our lives and say, what are the spots? What are the blemishes? What are the things that stain our garments? And they're different for every one of us. And we need to cleanse those out of our lives, washing with the water of the word and get rid of those things so that God can write upon our minds and upon our hearts, his word and his will, and we can become reflections of him in all that we do. Now, when we look at this, this is an idea that is it there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, not a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And for this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven, if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up in life. And of course, that is our hope, is for a change of nature. Not that we would be unclothed, a soul drifting off to heaven, as the pagans would have us believe, but rather that we would be changed, we would be clothed upon with immortality, and that we would have a change of nature, so we can serve God in perfection. Now, this is the picture, of course, that we have of that bride of Christ. It comes up in Psalm 45 and verse 13. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought 
unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. So this is the idea of that preparation period. And it requires action on our behalf to prepare our garments. Now, we read of this in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now we looked at that passage just a few minutes earlier, but notice the emphasis. She has made herself ready. She has put effort into this. This is participation on her behalf. Not that she earns it, because it's granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, but she has to participate in this process of making herself ready. And that's what we have to do, brothers and sisters. That's why we come to Bible school, to remind ourselves of these things, so that we can begin that, or continue that, process of preparing ourselves for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which, of course, will be very shortly. And so... In summary, as we've looked at this, the man of one is a picture of the multitudinous Christ. The elements that are described are representatives of characteristics that we need to develop. The idea of being clothed with a white garment to the foot indicates that we are being fully clothed in righteousness, that we have to have a watching mind being alert so that we being alert will be found clothed that our faith is imputed to us for righteousness. We don't earn it, but we have to participate in it. We need to be cleansed, and we need to have our nature changed in the kingdom of God, and that is what we are hoping for. So as we consider this, brethren and sisters, we want to now go back to our man of one in, in Daniel chapter 10 and just take a look at this next expression there. He's clothed in linen, which we read in, in the 12th chapter is that white linen. But in verse 5 here, we read that his loins are girded with fine gold of euphaz. Well, the loins there is the idea of the, the loin area, the hips. And um, it is the idea of being girded or binding on a belt or a girdle. This is where we would typically bind a belt on. And um, it's with fine gold or pure gold. So this is the idea that we want to spend some time looking at now is this idea of fine gold of euphaz. This is what is around his loins. So when we consider this idea of fine gold of euphaz, euphaz, the word itself, number 210, is actually a corruption of the Hebrew word Ophir, which, which means to reduce to ashes. And it's a city in southern Saudi Arabia where Solomon obtained his gold. And so this is what we read in 1st of Chronicles 1 verses 17 to 23. The sons of Shem are Faxad and, and so on and so forth. And, and Joktan begat Sheba and Ophir and Havilah. So these are the sons of Shem and they are related to this area of Ophir. And this is where, as we read in 1st Chronicles chapter 29 in verse 3, um, he says that because I set my affection to the house of my God, I have of mine own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God uh, over and above all that I have prepared for the house, uh, for the holy house, even 3,000 talents of gold and a gold of Ophir, 7,000 talents of silver, um, refined silver, that is, and overlay, to overlay the, the walls of the house therewith. So this is David's preparation and Solomon's uh, work then as he, in um, <clears throat> we read in, in uh, First of Kings, actually 22, this is actually Jehoshaphat, he also made ships of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold, <clears throat> but they went not, for the ships were broken at Ezion Geba. So as we look at the what was brought to the temple to glorify it, it was the fine gold of Ophir. So what does that mean? It was gold of Ophir, which meant burning or the idea of something that's refined. Um, well, in the scriptures, when we look at this idea of gold, it's the idea of wisdom and of faith. And so this is what we read in Job chapter 28. 
where shall wisdom be found? Verse 12. And where is the place of understanding? Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. It cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir. The gold of the crystal, uh, gold and crystal cannot equal it. The exchange of it shall not be for jewels or of fine gold. For the price of wisdom is above rubies, neither shall it be valued with pure gold. So what God is telling us here is that wisdom is of greater value than the best gold in all the world. Now, the product of godly wisdom is faith. And, and we know where faith comes from. We read in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. And it's a quality that's impossible to have, uh, not to have in, in order to please God. As we read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So this man of one if we want to be part of that man of one, it's impossible if we do not have the characteristic of faith. And faith comes from the wisdom of the word. And so when we consider this, um, look at the Psalms, Psalm 19. Um, this is what transforms us into the man of one. Uh, verse 7, the law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the symbol. So there's that simple. There's that wisdom. We might be simple, but the wisdom of the word can make us wise. The statutes of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure. Remember, it's pure gold of Ophaz, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether, and more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them thy servant is warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. And brothers and sisters, there is great reward, because we can be part of that man of one. But we need to desire it more than much fine gold. So whatever our jobs are, whatever our careers are, whatever our goals are in this world, the pursuit of the wisdom of the world must supersede that. We've got to love it more than what we love anything in this life. And nothing can be compared with it. We read in the 119th Psalm, verse 127, Therefore, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. And it's that last little phrase there that probably we struggle with a little bit, is hating the false ways, hating the evil of this world. That's what we need to learn to do and to love God and to love his word. Now, Proverbs chapter 8 puts it this way, Receive my instruction, and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared with it. Because the wisdom of the word will generate in us faith, and faith is imputed to us for righteousness so that we can be part of that man of one. And so that's where we've got to set our goal in all things. It has to be the pursuit of our lives as we read in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 16. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather than the cho chosen to be chosen uh, rather to be chosen than silver. So this is what we want to do is understanding has to be chosen above our pursuit of silver, of the good of this world. As an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon the obedient ear. And this is what it requires of us. It requires us to listen to God and to have an obedient ear, which is the idea of Shema, Shema Yisrael, right? To hear, O Israel, to hear with obedience. That's the idea. And so we have it also in the Lamentations. How then is gold become dim? How is the most fine gold changed? The stones of the sanctuary are poured out into upon the, every street. The precious sons of Zion, comparable, comparable to fine gold, how are they esteemed as earthen pitchers and the work of hands of the potter? And brothers and sisters, 
the precious sons of Zion are comparable to fine gold, but much more than fine gold. They are precious. And when you look at the room around you and you see your brothers and sisters and on the right hand and on the left, they are more precious in the eyes of God than all the gold in the world. How do we esteem them, brothers and sisters? How do we look at one another? Is our brother over here who's having a struggle, is he more precious to us than fine gold? And, and, and do we reach out to save him from the world and to pull him back into the, the, the bounds of the ecclesia like we would if, if we had a, a gold coin that dropped out of our hand and was rolling down the road? Um, would we not chase after that coin and grab a hold of it? That's what we've got to see. The precious sons of Zion is, is more precious and comparable than gold. That's how God sees them. And that's how we need to see one another. Now, the other issue that is with this gold is that it is gold of Euphaz. It is tried gold. And we read this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, that the trial of our faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So as gold is refined, so our faith is needs to be refined and that's what God is looking for is a clear uh, uh, refined faith. Now this idea of refining and this idea of, of purifying is one that we read of in the scriptures of truth. It's the smelting process, uh, the refining process that we go through right now. And so we read in Proverbs chapter 17 verse 3, the fining pot is for the silver, the furnace for gold, but Yahweh trieth the hearts. And that's what God does in our lives. He brings tribulation into our lives to refine us. And Job chapter 23, verse 10, he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And so this is what God is doing with us. He brings us through tribulation and trial to refine us as gold. And what we are going through right now with tribulation in this world, um, we have the lockdowns all over the place where basically we are not able to assemble. Um, perhaps you can in South Africa, in, in Canada right now, we are locked down. We are not allowed more than five people in our house. And so there are issues that we run into and in those issues what is it that we are going to do and that's really the question of the day you see refining was a process whereby the impurities were purged out until the refiner could look into the the vessel that held the, the molten gold or silver or whatever it was and could see a reflection of himself there when all the dross was taken off and that's what God is trying to do with us, is to refine us until he can see a reflection of himself. And so in Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 9, we read that the same process was going on with Israel. He says, I will bring the third part through the fire and refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call upon my name and I will hear them and I will say it's my people and they shall say Yahweh is my God. So that's what God is going to do with Israel as he prepares them for fitness in the kingdom of God. It's the same process that he does with us. He's been doing it with them for years. We read of Isaiah chapter 18, or 48 sorry, and verse 10. Behold, I have refined thee. Not with silver, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. And so this is what God does with them, but it's also what he does with us. Acts 14 verse 22, the apostle Paul was exhorting the disciples to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Now it's not tribulation without a purpose, it's tribulation to refine us and to cleanse us. And when problems come up in our lives, when issues come up, we we have to look and say, how am I supposed to manifest the character of God in this circumstance? Because God is looking for his reflection in me. What is the dross that I've got to cleanse, cleanse out of my life so that God can see the reflection of his character in my actions at this point in time? Through much tribulation, we enter the kingdom of God. 
Now, John gives us <clears throat> a little more detail again in Revelation chapter 1. Um, the same thing, though, that Daniel saw. He sees there in verse uh, 13, one like the Son of Man girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Now, we have the meaning of this again. Girt is the idea of fastening a belt or a girdle um, around oneself, right? And the idea of, of the paps is the Greek word mastos, which we have the breasts, so that's why the, the depiction here is it's quite quite high up. Uh, it's where we get the word mastectomy from, so it's the idea of being girt right to the breasts. And we have here, of course, this is fine gold. Um, curios, uh, curosis. Um, it's the idea of, of gold that overlays something that's precious, that is used in the making of ornaments. And it's a girdle again, or a belt. Um, <clears throat> the Greek word is the zone, and that's why Brother Thomas calls it the golden zone. Um, and it would basically cover that whole area. It's the area where there's a hollow usually in here where money would be kept. And this is where we would put our precious valuables, keep them close to us and close to our heart. And so the angels with the vials uh, were clothed this way, like the angels in Ezekiel as well. They were clothed in pure linen, and white having their breasts girded with golden girdles. Now, when we look at this and we consider how this idea is used in Scripture, we have the words of Job 40 again. Job's actually very helpful in this area. And in verse 16, Lo, his strength is in his loins, uh, and his force in the navel of his belly. So it's the idea of the muscles of the stomach. This is what the golden zone would cover, is the muscles of the stomach. So it's the idea of strength, or in the case of Belteshazzar, um, that is spoken of Cyrus, whose right hand have I hold into some new nations before him. He says, I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leave gates, and the gates shall not be shut. And it's a, it's a wonderful picture of Cyrus where God says, I've held his hand like a little child is the idea they're little toddler little two-year-old you take their hand and you lead them by the hand that's what God did with Cyrus in bringing him against Belshazzar and of course in Belshazzar's feast we read that his loins were loose and his knees knocked once again one against another so that's the picture of the lack of strength but the strength is supposed to be in the loins so it's also used very interestingly, um, I, uh, Ezekiel, sorry, Ezekiel, Elijah, um, they, they answered him, he was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. Um, and they said, this is Elijah the Tish Tishbite. And of course, that girdle is what gets used um, in, the, uh, in the, the parting of the sea. The mantle actually is what's used in the parting of the, the waters there. But this idea of the girdle, um, Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 11, as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith Yahweh, that they might be unto me for a people and for a a name and for a praise and for a glory, but they would not hear. So it's the precious stuff, right? So this is where we put our wallet, where we put our precious stuff, and God says that Israel was precious to him and he wanted them to cleave unto him the gird like a girdle, but they wouldn't have it. But that's what God looks for in us. So God said unto him, I am thy God, almighty, this is talking to Abraham. When we look at the loins, the idea of a promised seed, be fruitful and multiply. Nations and a company of nations shall come out of thee. King shall come out of thy loins. So this is the same idea of, of the, the girdle which would go around the loins. Kings would come from thy loins. And of course, uh, Second Chronicles 6 and verse 9, um, David is promised that thou shalt not build the house, but thy son which shall come forth out of the lo thy loins, he shall build a house for my name. So this is the idea of the promised seed. The citizens of the man of one are Abraham's seed according to the promises kings and priests of the Melchizedek order they are of the loins of the man of one so to speak now there's another aspect to the loins as well it's also the idea of preparedness if we think of the loins when we go back to the Passover 
in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 11, we read there, First shall you eat of it with your loins girded and your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat in haste. It is Yahweh's Passover. So the idea of being girded also had that idea of having your loins girded ready for action. And this is, of course, what we find with um, uh, uh, Elijah on the road to Jezreel, the hand of Yahweh was upon Elijah. He girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of, of Jezreel. The same is, is said of, of Jeremiah, that the idea of preparing to speak truth without fear. Gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. So the idea of being ready for action and to ready to speak the word of God to our brothers and sisters. So that's the way we have to be, ready to speak the truth to those that are about us. And so that's the idea when we, when we come to um, look at the, the, the symbology of the loins. Um, this is where the weapons were girded. So if we just think of 2 Samuel 20 verse 8, um, when Amasa, um, uh, Job, Job's garment that he put on was girded about him, and upon his girdle was a sword and fastened upon his loins in the sheath thereof, and as he went forth it fell out. And, and so, of course, there was great destruction there. But this is the idea of this is where the loins you would gird your sword on. And of course, we saw this in Ezekiel chapter 9, where behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lies towards the north. Every man had a slaughter weapon in his hand, and one man upon them um, was has his loins Sorry, and one man among them was clothed with linen with a writer's inkhorn by his side or his loin. So, so he goes out with the power of the pen, the power of writing upon people. But it's that idea of being prepared for battle, prepared for speaking, prepared for using the sword of the spirit, as we'll see in a moment. So it's also, though, a symbol of service. So action action that involves service. And of course, we see this with the Lord Jesus Christ at the Last Supper. In John chapter 13 and verses 4 and 5, he rose from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And in verse 15, he says, I have given you an example that you should do even as I have done. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the master is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that sent greater than he that sent him. So the Lord says, I have girded myself, I have prepared myself to serve. I expect you to prepare yourselves to serve one another, just as I've done. You're not greater than I am. That's the goal. So all these symbols represent action in the truth. This is what we must be about. And that's, of course, the idea um, that we have in First of Peter. We're not accepted from this. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ in 1 Peter 1 and verse 13. So we have to remove all the clutter, the things that would, would get in our way and gird up our loins. So if we think of in Old Testament times, if somebody was to run, they would literally take all their long robes, gird them up into their loin girdle, so they would tie them up there so that their legs were free from encumbrance and they could run. And this is what we read of in Hebrews 12 verse 1, seeing encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us so remove all those things that would stand in our way and be prepared to run that race and so that's the idea we have now. We, we talked about the, the loins being where you would gird on your sword. And of course, this is the idea of being equipped and ready for battle. And Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, we're told to take unto us the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and above all things to taking the shield of faith, wherewith you be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we see here the loins are girt about with truth. 
And we have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which is usually girt upon the thigh, upon the loins, and that we can pull that out and use it basically to be ready for battle, first against our own flesh and the own corruption in our mind where our flesh is telling us constantly to do things that we shouldn't do, and second, to be able to speak the truth in love to those around us and to share that gospel truth and also to be able to counter the arguments of those who would try and counter God himself. So this is the idea that we have, and this is the instruction that the Lord gives us. This is what it means to be part of that man of one. And this is what the Lord says. Turn, if you would, to, to Luke chapter 12, because in Luke chapter 12, this is a direct instruction of the Lord Jesus Christ to us. He tells us there in verse 12, uh, verse 35 of Luke 12, let your loins be girded about with uh, and your lights burning. And so he says, and you yourselves liken to men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, he may open immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he will gird himself and make them sit down to meet and come forth and serve them. So this is the idea of the Lord Jesus Christ tells us we need to be spiritually alert, to be ready, to have our loins girded as people that are ready, that wait for their Lord, that when he comes, we can jump up immediately and be ready to meet him, not be worried about, oh, you know, what are the things in our lives that need to be dealt with? We deal with them now while we have opportunity, while it is today. So the last thing we want to note in in the last few minutes we have this morning is that the girdle was around the heart and around the organs, and, and it was gold, right? So what does this tell us? Well, just think, if you would, in, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19 and 20, we're told not to lay out for ourselves treasures on earth, where moss and, moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal, but lay out for ourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and thieves do not break through, through nor steal. Where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. And you put your wallet in your girdle. That's where it would go. And so the meaning of this has great sort of uh, uh, relevance to us because the word treasure here is the word in the Greek thesaurus, an interesting word, a storehouse, um, a strong room, a magazine or a vault or a receptacle, um, receptacle for valuables. This is where we would put our valuables. And so we have a thesaurus, which is a vault of words. And we look up a thesaurus to find other words that mean the same thing. Well, the original meaning of that was a treasure house or a storeroom where you would put your valuables. Well, the girdle is around the heart. And so we have to ask ourselves, what do we pile up in our treasure vault? What is valuable to us? And again, uh, Psalm 119 verse 11, the psalmist says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So that's what we need to do. Proverbs chapter two, my son, if you will receive my words, hide my commandments with thee so that thou incline thine ear to wisdom, which is better than fine gold, as you read, apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lifteth up thy voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver, and search for her as hid treasure. So that's what we've got to treasure up is the word of God. It's got to be the most valuable thing that we can have. And in fact, when Queen Victoria was crowned, they hand her the Bible and they say, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing this world affords. And the same is true of Queen Elizabeth. Well, it is the most valuable thing that this world can afford us is the word of God. And it's given to us by him. So it's where our treasure is. So we're told provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, but rather we have to have the word of God in our purses. That's what's got to be treasured and close to our heart and in that golden zone, in that girdle. But we have to remember at the same time, brothers and sisters, that the treasure of the truth that we have is in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And so even though we have great treasure, we are a bunch of clay pots all of us in perfect right now, waiting to be clothed upon with immortality. And we need to remember that as we look around the room. We look around the room and we see blemishes. We see things that, you know, are maybe not perfect, but we're all works in progress. And we have to have the humility to realize that God is working a work in you and I as he is in our brothers and sisters around us. 
And our goal has to be assist them, assisting them in the walk towards the kingdom, recognizing that all of us are earthen vessels into which the treasure of the truth has been put and never to think of ourselves more highly than we ought and recognize that the fact that we have the truth is the doing of the father the power and the excellency is of god it's not of us it's not our doing it's not my knowledge and my understanding and oh i'm so good None of that at all. It's thank God for the truth that he has given us that we can share with others. It doesn't make us better in that sense than our brothers and sisters. It's just something that we can work with and share with them and be involved in this. And that's the kind of people that we need to be. And so we, we think of this in the book of Revelation. This is what we need to be about. In Revelation 3, verse 18, we're told, I counsel to thee, uh, thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. So what the Lord wants us to do is put our effort into buying gold. Not the gold of the world, but the gold of the spirit, right? Gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, which is faith, which comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. And it requires buying. It requires effort, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and to anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. And that idea of watching comes up once again. This is what the Lord exhorts us to do. Prepare ourselves to be part of that man of one. Purchase the necessary materials, the gold and the raiment, and cleanse your eyes that you can see. It requires effort, not necessarily money, as the world around us would value things, but it requires the effort we read of in Isaiah 55 and verse 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come to me here, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. So that's what we are encouraged to do, is to come to that waters, to come to the great well that the Lord Jesus Christ told the woman of Samaria that whosoever drinks of it would never thirst again but it would like a wellspring in him flowing waters out to all peoples round about and that's the kind of people we need to be is people who have taken the time and the effort and, and expensed our energies in finding out what our God wants us to do and what we are to be about that brothers and sisters is our goal to become part of that man of one to put the effort and the energy in now so in summary of what we have looked at today um, in this class this morning, the loins girded, we have that golden zone as the word is in the Greek, uh, and it requires to make an investment to search for the wisdom of God. This is the true riches, and it is likened to faith, the gold of faith. Faith, of course, which comes from hearing the word of God, and that word is refined, or that faith is refined through tribulation. We have to put the effort in, do our readings every day, study our Bibles, find out what our God wants there, the great treasure that's in his scriptures of truth. And treasure the truth with all our hearts. It should be what fills our girdles or our wallets, right? This is what we've got to be investing in. Never mind stocks and bonds and all this kind of stuff. Invest in the truth. Put our effort and our time into these things. This is what is eternal. All the rest will go away. Having our loins girded is equivalent to having our minds girded with the thinking of God. This is true strength. Having our thoughts all prepared so that when temptation comes, we, like the Lord, can answer, hast thou not read? It is written so that we can counter it with the word of God and not involve ourselves in these things. And be ready to serve our God like the prophets of old, being ready, loins girded about, ready to act. And that's the process we have. Our goal is to be like him. And this is who he is. Isaiah 11 verse 5, righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. It is his loins girt about with faith which is imputed to him for righteousness. This is, after all, what the Lord is. He is the firstborn of many creatures, the prototype of a race of people who will manifest his father's characteristics and eventually will fill the earth with his glory. May God give us the strength to finish the work in our ecclesias, in our families, and in ourselves.
Thank you for the time this morning, brethren and sisters.